Okay. Uh, uh, can you hear me? Okay. Thank, thanks, Bob, uh, for the introduction. Yes, so as you see, I've been in a uh, uh, number of different things, and in starting from engineering to collider physics to dark matter physics. Uh, what I'm going to talk, talk to you about today, uh, first two-thirds would be spanned entirely on dark matter, direct detection dark matter. Um, and the last one-third, I'll spend on what else our detectors can do. Uh, when you have uh, uh, really nice detectors, there are a number of things you could do. So as, as an outline, um, first I'll talk about dark matter. Some of you might not know what dark matter is or how, how sure we are that there's dark matter. I'll spend some time talking about my experiment, cryogenic dark matter search. It's a collaboration of multiple universities. Then talk about other current technologies, for example, James White's liquid Xena. Um, then tell you about how our fabrication, the dedicated fabrication facility, has sort of changed the landscape, uh, so to speak, over the last couple of years, made our technology much more competitive. Then I'll spend, like I said, one third of time on how our detectors enable us to do something beyond dark matter. Talk about neutrinos, axions, millicharged particle, ultralight dark matter. Okay, then I'll end the talk with a comparison with LHC, the Large Hadron Collider. So what's dark matter? As most of you know, if you look at the velocities of the planets around sun, they follow the Newtonian laws very well. Whereas if you look farther out uh, in the scale of galaxies, visible stars move much faster than expected. In fact, the velocities as you go farther out from the center of the galaxy, they stay flat. So it means there's a lot more mass that we can't see that's influencing us. And we can feel it, but we don't see it. So stars move much faster as they move out than we would expect. This clear evidence. It was seen 80 years ago uh, by Zwicky and then confirmed by Vera Rubin uh, across multiple uh, galaxies. So what is, what is really, uh, that sounds fancy, that sounds fascinating, there's a lot of dark matter. This is a bigger problem. It's also dark energy, as you so as you've been hearing lately. So it turns out our universe is really mostly not understood. We as scientists always would love to understand everything about everything, but it turns out we understand less than 4%. They spent a large number of years trying to understand, and we find that it's only a small fraction. There's a huge amount of dark energy, which you have no idea about. Then there's dark matter, which we think we know a little more about. Okay, so dark matter is, you know, take any galaxy, most of the galaxies have a lot of dark matter, there's a halo, most of the dark matter is clumped towards the center because of gravitational attraction. Because remember, dark matter. Dark means they have no light, no matter because we can feel the pull. Like think about uh, a no moon night. You don't see the moon, but you still see the tide in the ocean. So that, think about that, okay? You can feel it, but you don't see it. But then people start saying maybe it's modified Newtonian gravity, maybe the Newtonian gravity doesn't apply as you go to large scales. It turns out if you look, uh, this is a bullet cluster, which really changed our viewpoint uh, tremendously. It, it turns out there's, uh, there's, a, there's one example where two galaxies went through, clusters for galaxies went through each other. In dark matter, they would just go right through, like host. Okay? They have very little interaction, weak interaction. Whereas the ordinary matter gets a lot, lot of drag, so they fall behind. Ordinary matter, as seen through X-ray, and blue is where most of the matter is through lensing, okay? So there's clear evidence that there is, there is dark matter. Of course, there are many other evidences, but this is striking, very striking. So you know dark matter exists from many different measurements, lensing, cosmic microwave background, uh, 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 the uh, star's velocities, and the bullet cluster. But the question is, what is it? What is it made of? Can we detect it? Okay, so it's probably some particle that got created at the beginning of the universe after the Big Bang. When the universe was hot, there was a lot of energy, e equals mc squared, you can create any number of particles that you want. And they have survived all these years, so they must be stable. Because the dark matter is probably primordial, probably stable. That's where we see them. And they, they outnumber ordinary matter by a factor of five. Okay, pretty significant. So what exactly has happened in the last, uh, over the last, uh, couple of centuries. So particle physics, as you know, they start looking at smaller and smaller things, start making uh, higher energy colliders so they can probe deeper and deeper, atoms, nucleus, quarks, maybe something else is there. It turns out the astronomers looking farther out, they find things that we, it turns out it's, we're look, going after the same thing. Astronomers find huge evidence for dark matter, and it turns out it might be connected to particle physics. 
That's where the beauty is. Okay? And it turns out when they uh, talk to each other, they're after the same thing. This impressive is, or amazing, and gives you a chance for, or hope for uh, exciting career in physics, especially if you're in particle physics or astronomy. Very little of the universe is what we understand. Spent 200 years finding the uh, elephant's tail, so to speak, because there's a huge amount of dark matter. Okay? A dark matter has gravity, so that's where you can fill the pool. It probably has weak interaction. There's evidence that it might have weak interaction. No electromagnetic, that's why it doesn't emit light or doesn't reflect light or doesn't absorb light. Okay? Probably not strong interaction because that's very short. Uh, okay, so that's, that's really impressive that there's a lot of stuff out there that people haven't found. Hopefully we can find. We can do something to understand what's going on. But first, some idea of what exactly are we after? Is it a particle? Probably yes. There's, if you look at uh, combined astrophysics with standard model particle physics, it turns out if these particles were created early in the universe and we see one-fourth of the universe in that form, then it naturally gives rise to a, a cross-section that's weak interaction cross-section, massive particle with weak interaction cross-section. None of those, none, no such particle exists in the standard model. Must be something new. It turns out supersymmetry, which is going to combine fermions and bosons and explain the unified statistics, it also predicts a particle about the same mass and interaction scale, cross-section, okay? So it's compelling evidence that it's the particle we are looking for is weakly interacting massive particle. It may be a coincidence too. We really don't know. But that's the most compelling particle that we have. So how do you go after this part, this kind of particles? Gravitational, as you saw, indirect. You send uh, detectors out into space. That's where actually a lot of collider folks go into, like dark energy survey and you know positron, electron detectors in the space. In a large hadron collider, you're going to produce because you create big bang-like energy. So you can produce it and then study it. What I'm going to focus on is direct detection. Detector on Earth looking for this dark matter particle that are flowing through us. That's what my focus would be. At, a, at the Large Hadron Collider, you collide high energy beams, then you have a lot of energy, then you can produce dark matter particles. It's not that simple, but you know that's the big picture. That you produce particle that you detect with your detector. In fact, the signature is that you don't detect it. That's the missing energy. How are we going to detect it? We know dark matter exists out there. If we have a detector on Earth, some fine morning it might collide with our detector, and you might see a signature if you have the right kind of detector. That's what the goal is. If you think about it, the number of the dark matter is out there in large numbers. It's passing right through you right now. It doesn't. It has very weak interaction. That's why you don't feel it, unlike a car hitting you. It passes right through you, and you don't feel it, but it's out there. In fact, uh, one uh, easy thing to remember is if you take a bottle of Coke, there's at any point of time it has enough dark matter to be on the nutritional level, okay? Fortunately, it doesn't cause cancer. It's not ionizing, strongly ionizing. Okay, so that's, that sounds fine. I'm going to make a detector, detect the recoil of the particle as, it, as we plow through the universe, okay? So what you do is, it's a massive particle. You look for billiard ball scattering, really, okay? So you, uh, you, set, you put a target, your detector, and hope that the WAMP will collide with the detector, leaving sufficient energy that you can detect. If you do a back-of-the-envelope calculation for a germanium nucleus with a 100 GeV WIMP, the energy that you are going to liberate in such a recoil goes up to 10 of keV, 10 keV or so. Just to give a uh, benchmark, an, an electron volt is the light uh, energy of the visible light. So plenty of energy. It's easy, sort of. That's why a lot of experiments all over the world do it. And Everybody is in the race to find, to be the first one, or at least the second one, uh, to find dark matter. How do you do it? A traditional ionization detector. WIMP comes and recoils. You're going to, in your detector, the tens of keV of energy is going to liberate a large number of electron hole pairs. So you apply an electric field, ground, and bias it on one side. You should be able to collect the signal, and you see something. Well, the rate is, if you do a quick calculation, the rate is pretty small. That's what makes it very challenging. Less than 0.01 event per kilogram per day. If you have a kilogram of detector, wait for a day, it's going to be very small. But the background is million times more, millions of billions of times more. So that makes it very, very challenging. Why is there so much background? Everything around us is radioactive, unfortunately. 
if you drink a glass of beer, it's going to, and if you have your detector right next to it a meter away, it's going to see a million gammas over a day or so. Okay? So the technique is shield your detector. There are many, many different techniques to shield it. So basically, you provide a block against the external background. And that's a standard technique that's used by all the experiments, uh, dark matter experiments. The background comes from cosmogenic, comes from the cosmos like muon, neutron. Uh, it could be radioactive, beta decay. Okay? So the goal is, if you were to fall asleep at this point, the entire goal is you have this tiny signal, a needle in the haystack, and you're trying to beat down on the background so that you hope you see a signal that's significant enough that you can claim discovery. How do you do it? You have to reduce the background, literally, the way I showed you, uh, and reject with sophisticated detectors. How do you reduce the cosmogenic background? It is coming from the cosmos. And most of it is really muons. And muons, fortunately, if you go deeper down into the Earth, they get blocked by the overburden, the Earth itself. That's why all dark matter experiments go to underground mines. Our experiment is in northern Minnesota. Uh, it's about half a mile underground, so most of the muons stop along the path. Muons are dangerous because they kick out neutrons, which will look just like our dark matter that we are trying to find out. Okay, so this I'm going to sh start showing you some uh, some uh, things about our own experiment, but this is generic, applies to any dark matter experiment. Various layers of shielding. One is called plastic scintillator veto. If something is coming from outside, it's not dark matter. Dark matter also comes from outside. For dark matter, remember, it is very weak interaction, so it's going to hit your detector only once, perhaps, when it does. It's not going to hit something else as well. That's where the veto works so well in rejecting external radioactive background. They're also polyethylene because neutrons, a lot of neutrons uh, uh, surrounding you in the, in the rock, and also lead to protect against gammas. There's also very low activity lead, which turns out lead is uh, radioactive. There's a half-life of 22 years. So you want lead that has been not exposed to uh, cosmogenic activation for a long, long time. It has decayed away. In fact, this inner layer of lead has been obtained from a ship that was under the ocean. You know, it sunk 100 years ago. So it's paid a lot of money to get that, and that's beautiful. That's the last layer of defense. Okay? So that's, what, that's the length you have to go to, <laughs> to do a dark matter search. Okay, so that's generic. applies to any dark matter experiment. So you reduce it, but it's not all gone. There's still some left. You have to find ways to make detectors that reject what you don't want. What you're after is weakly interacting massive particles. What you don't want is electromagnetic interactions. Okay? So if something has electromagnetic interaction, for example, gamma or electrons, they will collide preferably with the electron in your, uh, in your target, whereas WIMPs will collide with your nucleus. That's the main uh, handle that we have. The difference in the recoil is what we're after. The big picture is less ionization from nuclear recoil, more ionization from the electron recoil. Because electron is pretty uh, uh, light, so if something knocks on the electron, it's going to move around quite a bit and ionize very efficiently. So that's the main difference that we are going to go after. But the question is, how do you know what energy? If something comes and hits me, if I don't know what energy to start with, then I have no idea what more or less means. So there must be a separate handle to know what you've just seen, okay? And that is obtained by different techniques. When the particle recoils in your detector, it's going to dissipate energy in different forms. It, and some detectors take advantage of ionization. Some take advantage of phonons. Some take advantage of light, scintillation light. Many experiments, the world-leading experiments, they take advantage of more than one detection mechanism. Why? Because if you do that, for example, CDMS measures ionization and phonon. Phonon is the true energy. So it doesn't care what type of particle it is. But ionization does care. If it's a background particle, it has equal amount of energy in phonon and ionization, whereas signal is lower. Because remember, I told you uh, the WIMP recoil, the nuclear recoil, has low ionization. So that's how we detect. This is what we want. This is what we don't want. And they're very well separated. Now, as you see this picture, there's one thing that you think about. If you, if you think about the quanta, the quantum of energy, there's a huge difference in the quantum of energy in these modes. Phonons takes a milli-electron volt to excite a quantum, okay, to make a quantum. Whereas light, it'll kilo-electron volt when you combine all sorts of efficiency. There's a million to one difference. For example, at a KEV, 
that's sort of the energy range we are looking after at the lower end, you will have a million fauna where there's no light quantum, probably, just at the edge. There's a huge difference in statistics. That's where we love phonons. Our detectors are designed to take advantage of the phonons because there's a lot of statistics out there. How do you make a detector that can detect phonons? The simple idea is you have a, a, a low temperature detector that's held at very low temperature. The particle reaction is going to warm it up. It's going to dump some energy, so it warms up, and you measure the change in temperature. Of course, the change in temperature is going to be small because the energy deposition is small. It means you have to keep your detector at a lower temperature if you're going to take advantage of phonons. Okay? What do we, we do? We, uh, like I told you, we measure ionization and phonon. It's, I don't do it myself, of course. It's a collaboration of many universities, Caltech, Stanford, Berkeley, MIT, Texas A&M, many, many universities, about 70 people working on this experiment. The basic idea is you make phonon sensors. I'll tell you in a while how they work. But ionization, remember, I need to collect ionization, the electron hole pairs, and the phonon sensors on the top. Um, it, you know, if you like these chips, detector chips, you can take a look at it. It's, uh, we have enough to pass them around. Uh, they are designed to detect phonons. I'll tell you in a moment how to do it, how it's done. But we, at the end of the day, we want to measure ionization using simple electrodes and phonons using the fancy sensor. And these detectors are kept inside all possible layers of shielding so we can reject all the background. Okay? The detectors themselves are like hockey pucks. Three inch by one inch detectors like a hockey puck. And they're arranged like in a tower-like structure, six in a tower. And it's kept at millikelvin temperature, 40 millikelvin, almost absolute zero temperature. And we read out ionization and phonons. Who invented this technology? It's really particle physics meeting condensed matter. Blas Cabrera at Stanford, who is a, a condensed matter physicist, and uh, Bernard Chatelet, who works in experimental high energy physics. So if you might remember, he is the one who, uh, who was the leader of the UA1 detector, which uh, discovered the W and Z boson 30 years ago. So they, they joined forces and came up with this technology. The basic idea is when the recoil happens, you produce electron fold pairs as, as usual. But the vibration also creates a lot of phonons. So you detect both. Propagate the electrons using an electric field and detect the phonons using a special phonon sensor. How does it work? The way it works is this. So if you look at one of our detectors, like the image I had at the beginning of my uh, talk, and also when you look at this detector, there are about 4,000 sensors. Each one is like 4,000 thermometers. You're looking at the change in temp temperature. On a three inch crystal, 4,000 sensors. The way it works is from vibration, the phonons come in. There's, there's aluminum here, which is superconducting. Remember, we operated at 40 millikelvin temperature. Aluminum superconducts at one Kelvin. So it's a superconductor. And there's a transition air sensor. The way it works is phonons break the Cooper pair. It takes only milli electron volt to break. It's like superconducting band gap which is milli-electron volt. It takes very little amount of energy to break the Cooper pairs. And the quasi-particles, the liberated quasi-electrons and holes, they're collected by a tungsten transition air sensor. The way the transition air sensor works, tungsten would also superconduct at that temperature. But what we do is we dump a known amount of current through it. So we keep it in a stable equilibrium. Kent Irwin, who was, uh, was at NIST and who was a graduate student of Blas Cabrera, he came up with the idea that if you voltage bias this detector, something magical happens. What happens is you find a stable equilibrium point. If you have an interaction, the temperature goes up and your resistance goes down. So you see a certain rise in current. That's what you detect. But the joule heating now is less, so it's going to cool it down very quickly. It brings it back to stable equilibrium. Same both ways. So it's a very stable, it, the sensor stays in stable equilibrium, always brings it back to the stable point. So you keep taking data and looking for interactions. Okay? So these detectors work beautifully in reconstructing the position. Collimated sources, we can reconstruct position and reconstruct energy very, very well. So we have a nice detector. With this detector, we have been searching for WAMS for the last decade, one and a half decades, really. In Sudan for the last decade. Uh, I, uh, I gave a colloquium two and a half years ago on, on this result. 
two signal candidates. We found two candidates when we looked, did a blind analysis of our data. And this, this uh, turns out it's consistent with what we expected in the background. It's, it's, it, it is interesting, but you can't, with the given statistics, you can't say anything that you've seen or not seen something. Okay, when you don't see something, then you produce what's called exclusion plot. It's probably too deep for a colloquium, but I'll just tell you the main point. The cross-section is on the y-axis, weight mass is on the x-axis. So what we say is this curves, cross-sections above a certain value are excluded. Why? Because if they are not excluded, we would have seen more events, produce only two events. That's the sort of hand-waving argument. It's called an exclusion plot. Okay, so we haven't discovered. What should we do? The rate, obviously you want more detectors, because if you want to detect something, it's going to depend on how many detectors you have on the flux and on the cross-section. Flux and cross-section, there's nothing you can do. Why? Because they're fixed by whoever made this, okay? So all we can do is number of detectors. More detectors, better detectors, but in a, in a finite funding scenario, you can't have all your wish come true. You can't just make more detectors. You have to make them cheaper so that you make more detectors for the same price. Well, it turns out the uh, CDMS detectors have been very expensive. So as we want to traverse this path to the future, CDMS Sudan initially was four kilogram. The Sudan, uh, Super CDMS Sudan experiment is 15 kilogram. The next one in Snow Lab, that will start in a couple of years, is a 100 kilogram, 200 kilogram experiment as of now. It, this path, as you traverse, it's, you see that it's an impossible task. Because each detector, each detector takes, uh, just to give you a scale, um, a small crystal like this, which weighs only 250 grams, it costs $100,000. So it's about 300, almost $400,000 uh, per kilogram. And if you multiply that, you want to do a 100 kilograms experiment, it's impossible. So you have to do something about it. These detectors are being made at Stanford so far, over the last decade and a half. Uh, it's a very lengthy process. They used to take, the, the main reason is they used to do it in a common fabrication facility, Stanford NanoFab, just like our Aggie Fab here. So you make detectors, send it to Berkeley for uh, testing, and it turns out the superconducting temperature that we critically depend on for our sensors to work, it's all over the place across the detector. So then you ion implant, fix it, then test it again. It takes a long time to make these detectors. And with that cost, we are not going to have any large experiment. So that's where we came in at Texas A&M. So uh, it's, it, the, our labs are spread over three floors uh, on the, in the ENPH building, the, where we used to be uh, three years ago. It's, there's, there are about $3 million in funding spent, uh, invested in it, and more than a $1 million in donated equipment. It, it turns out my, uh, most of these instruments are donated by a semiconductor company in Dallas. My brother happens to be a director of the company, so that made it easy. And that was the reason why I got started in this, because you can't have your own fab. Nobody has it. It's, it's, it takes a lot of money. But it was significant enough when you realize you have fantastic technology, but you can't scale it up. So it was, uh, uh, it was, uh, it was lucrative enough for DOE and NSF to fund this effort. Each one funded about a million dollars each, DOE career and NSF diesel funding to help us set up this fab. We got the instrument now, funded our personnel and other costs, so that we come off, we solve the crisis, or the budget crisis, so to say, in, in our field, okay? And the people who work in this, the Texas A&M group, number of graduate students and undergraduates, at any point of time, we have three to four undergraduates and three to four graduate students working in our group. The way we make the detector is standard semiconductor device techniques. Take a flat polished crystal, deposit thin films, and put a photoresist coating on it, expose it to the circuit that you want, and etch away what you don't want, you're left with the detector. Okay, that's the standard technique that we use. And the, 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 the heart of this all this effort is this almost half million dollar instrument, so it's a very fancy deposition system that can deposit thin films on eight crystals at a time. So you can make a large number of detectors very quickly. And it's fully computer controlled, one person presses the button and does it. Okay, this is in ENPH in a clean room. There are three clean rooms. Our labs are spread over them. We have fabricated detectors in less than 24 hours. To give you a scale, at Stanford it used to take two weeks to make a detector. So we got a huge leap 
in our fabrication technology. That's what helped us save the cost. Then what you, when you, once you deposit thin films, then you do what are called photolithography. You deposit with a photo uh, sensitive coating, just like your film cameras, which hardly anybody uses these days, including me. Uh, so you expose something that you want, develop it, then you see what you want. Similar thing here. So we got our detector that we want using standard semiconductor device techniques. Um, that's the photo lab in the NPH building. So that's where we do our detectors. And it's a dry etch system. Remember, you saw the wet etch, chemical etch. To get to get away from variations, remember, variations kill you because when you're dealing with superconducting sensors spread over an entire detector, over 4,000 sensors, you don't want variations. And at the end of the day, once you make detectors, we check each sensor, more than 4,000 sensors, make sure everything is working fine and mount them and send them out for science. We also test our films. That's very important. Remember, it's not just we came up with good instruments and developed something really good. We actually systematically went through, make sure the films that we are developing and the detectors we are making here are fundamentally improved quality. Uh, so to give you a couple of examples, the aluminum, the superconductor. Uh, once you make the quasi-particles, they have to diffuse through the superconductor. And uh, one measure of how good the diffusion is, is called resistivity ratio, room temperature to 4 Kelvin temperature. The higher the ratio, the better off you are, because you have less resistance for the quasi-particles to travel and get to the, your detecting sensors. We got about 25% better than what Stanford had. The atomic force microscope image, the grains are more well organized in our uh, films. Next is the big one, that where we really nailed uh, the biggest problem. The TC, the superconducting transition temperature for the tungsten, the active sensor, this is a spread of 20 millikelvin in Stanford detectors. We get down to 2 millikelvin. Some of our detectors have as low as 1 millikelvin temperature. Why is it so important? Each one, like I told you, is a sensor, is a transition a sensor. For, for example, if you were biased your detector to be here at the most sensitive, but at different parts of your detector, the transition temperature is different, you might have no sensitivity at all. That's why it's so important to have very tight superconducting transition in a film. So that's what helped us improve this technology fundamentally much better than what Stanford had done. So combined with our better yield because of better instruments, we have brought down the cost to $50,000 per kilogram. Okay? And the yield is remarkably better. So many things lined up for us to get to this point. Uh, one of the very important things, if you look at this transition as sensor that I showed you earlier, phonons going into aluminum uh, superconductors and tungsten transition as sensor, the quasi-particles have to travel to your sensor. So this, this is a scanning electron microscopy image, the Stanford detectors, the connection from the top to bottom is not much. Tungsten is the white one, whereas on our detector, you see it's much better. So you're collecting phonons much better. So you can push down on the threshold of your detector much, much better. That has been a key improvement in our technology. So we made iZips, we call this iZips, nothing to do with iPhone, but uh, it's sort of the name came up after iPhones came up. Um, that's made in our, uh, in our lab. You can reconstruct position beautifully well with these iZip detectors with radioactive sources. This is uh, real data. Okay, so we have our detector for the future. We have lowered the cost, it's not there where we could imagine a ton scale, but certainly a much uh, bigger than the 10 kilogram scale experiment that we had uh, been doing. So we have our next phase is the snow lab. We go to a deeper site, much deeper site in, in Canada, snow lab, because the deeper you go, less uh, cosmogenic background, less problem with muons. So we go there and our proposal is to have a 200 kilogram experiment. It turns out even six months ago, our proposal used to be 100 kilograms. That's that had been the standing proposal. Because of the rapid development we have done at Texas A&M and reduction of the cost, we have just now changed it to 200 kilograms in the same budget. That's already a factor of two higher likelihood of detecting WIMPs. And it turns out it, we can push it to 400. So we have designed it optimistically for facilities for a 400 possible kilogram payload. Probably we'll go for. Uh, we can, since we can do this much cheaper at Texas a and probably we'll go for a private funding like astronomy, astronomers do. We'll see what happens. Uh, but so half of the detectors will be fabricated here. So it will be a large construction. So far there were no construction. It was only detector R&D. So starting next year we'll do construction and there will be a lot of opportunity for students. Looking beyond that, 
over the next five years, there will be ton scale. So you're already developing the technology for ton scale. You can't sit and wait, right? So ton scale, you can you notice one thing, 200 kilogram costs $30 million. One and a half ton costs only a factor of two because there's an economy of scale. You, you know, a lot of infrastructure money, uh, the, the funds go into in infrastructure a lot, okay? And also we expect reduction in the cost. Our hope is we'll bring down the cost even if another factor of two using various technologies. So we know how to go from where we are here. Right now we are in this phase, a little bigger detector, three inch by one inch. Go to the next phase, four inch by three inch. But also go to the ton scale. A ton scale, if this is what our current detectors look like, we're already developing technology that's going to look like this, six inch. Much, much bigger. Nobody else has the capability so far at least to be able to do that. No one else can do it six inch because these are industrial quality instruments. That's where we can do it. So important thing to realize is cost of the project scales with the number of detectors. The bigger the individual detectors you make, the cheaper it is going to be to make a project where you can propose and get funded. These are all the detectors we make. That's current detectors, next phase, generation two, generation three, where we're already working on generation three. Okay? So where is the complementarity or yeah. competition, if you please? It's not really competition, but it's, it couldn't get any closer. That's my lab. This is uh, James White's lab. He's working on, he's a leader in the liquid xenon technology invented a lot of the original ideas and how to operate liquid xenon technology. And Bob Webb, of course, has joined forces. And on my side, we have Rusty Harris, who is a joint faculty in physics. He has brought in his long experience in, uh, from electrical engineering department with the semiconductor fabrication technology. That has really helped us become successful in this effort. So the main idea is you can take any liquid noble, uh, liquefied noble gas and do an experiment. Only xenon sort of has proven that it, can, it is a viable technology. The main idea, the advantage of xenon is it doesn't take this millikelvin technology. So it's a simpler technology, simpler cryogenics. And the advantage is most of your radioactive background coming from outside, they'll naturally stop as they pass through the outer volume. So that you have a much quieter inner volume where you're going to search for waves. That's the advantage. The, the experiment that they are doing, which is the LUX experiment, there are two competing experiments, dual phase xenon experiment. This, it's similar idea as what we do. Recoil produces electron hole pairs, electrons, uh, uh, electrons, and then you apply an electric field, move the, uh, uh, transfer the electrons up to a much higher electric field here, which produces secondary light. So more ionization for electron recoil, less ionization for WIMPs, and you find out this is your signal. This is your background. It works beautifully well. The technology has the best WIMP surf sensitivity at this point of time. So two, like I told you, there are two competing experiments, Xenon 100 in Europe. It's a 30 kilogram fiducial mass, meaning the inner volume, the quiet mass, and a 100 kilogram experiment. They have the best limit in the world, more mass. And uh, the recent result, they see two events consistent with one event expected background. So really, we need a lot more detectors or bigger detectors. LUX is going to do that. That's what Texas A&M participates in. Uh, it's a 350 kilogram detector, 100 kilogram fiducial. It's a much bigger mass than we, have, we are used to. So it should really lead the world over the next couple of years. And also, there's competition in Europe. Argon, like I told you, any liquefied noble gas will uh, be able, you'll be able to use it with a similar fashion. Same concept. Okay, but unfortunately, the background is much higher. They can't operate at a uh, low threshold, and threshold is really the key in WIMP search. Why? Because the WIMPs, the slow WIMPs in the, in, the, in the dark matter halo, as they move through and collide with your detector, it's going to be an exponential recoil energy spectrum. You're going to get many fewer events where the energy is much higher, higher than, you know, as you go to higher and higher recoil energy, you have fewer and fewer events. So threshold is really the key. They are much, very different technologies, many very promising. For example, this is a room temperature technology. It's a bubble chamber. It used to be used in particle physics a long time ago, but as people moved into colliders, much higher rate experiments, this fell out of favor. But it has now come back as a viable technology for dark matter. But the idea is you hold the temperature and pressure of the superheated liquid well controlled where the amount of energy it takes to nucleate a bubble is just above your electromagnetic background 
what electromagnetic background can do. So you're insensitive to any electromagnetic background. A nuclear recoil happens. Nuclear recoil, remember, is very dense deposition of energy, very dense. You're, you know, over a few Fermi, you're depositing a lot of energy. So this technology works very well as well, but it's still background. The name of the game is, can you beat down your background to zero? If it is, then you, you can discover dark matter. Many of you might have heard about DAMA. That's an experiment in Europe which has looked for annual modulation. So what they find is with the sodium iodide crystals, very simple technology, ionization counters. There's no discrimination. You can't tell whether it's an electron recoil or nuclear recoil. You just count. And what they see is modulation that's consistent with the Earth going around the sun. Imagine you're going through a cloud. The Earth is going around the sun, so the relative velocity is going to be different in summer versus winter as you hit the uh, dark matter cloud, okay? So that the rates will be different in, December, in the winter and summer. So, but this could be also due to many other things. For example, the muon rate in the same lab has an annual modulation that's exactly in the same phase. So we don't really know, okay? And the disadvantage of this detector is you can't really tell event by event, by event what you're seeing. All you see is this count. A newer technology, cogent, I don't have time to go into this, it's, it's a germanium technology uh, that's operated at liquid nitrogen temperature. They see something, and they also claim to see some annual modulation. But both uh, the DAMA and the cogent result have been excluded by CDMS and xenon technologies, because we can push down to low threshold, I mean low threshold, and in this exclusion plot, this is CDMS result, it excludes <laughs> DAMA and cogent. Okay? So, and we see that we, we have uh, germanium and cogent has germanium. We can, our the background that we see matches exactly what they see, and you don't really have space for WIMPs in what they are seeing. We also don't see annual modulation, so we reject that. In all these things, as I'm saying, you, uh, the important thing to realize is you don't want background, you want low threshold. Why you don't want background? Because it takes way more statistics to claim that you have discovered something. And, and also your sensitivity, you, you can keep on taking data, it doesn't matter, because you get saturated with background. And threshold matters because you can get more, you can integrate over more part of the wave spectrum. And it's a really challenging game as we look forward over the next decade or so. For a ton scale experiment, this is the theoretically favored space. We can actually explore the entire space using a ton scale technology. But imagine you see no background with a ton of detector per year, you see nothing, absolutely quiet. Yes. We don't know how to do it. I, I mean, we'll try it, we are going to try it, we're going to develop the technology, but just to give you a flavor of what the challenges are in front of us. It's going to be an amazing challenge. So whoever gets the better control on the background will win the race, so to speak. So uh, by the way, the Particle Astrophysics Scientific Advisory Group in the US, they have always said that you want super CDMS plus some other technology. Why? Because super CDMS, the CDMS technology, is fundamentally a beautiful technology very well understood technology with known systematics. The problem is it's too expensive, but that's what we have been working on, how to cut down the cost. Okay, so when it comes to 2017 or so, we'll see which technology survives to go to the ton scale. There's not enough funds to do a lot of them, but I think there's consensus that we want two, at least two technologies, because you want to confirm what you've seen is WIMP or not. Okay, now of course there's the Large Hadron Collider, um, it's, uh, we don't really know what they will see beyond the Higgs. Hopefully they see evidence for supersymmetry so that it makes the job easier for us. If we get some handle on where the WIMPs might be, we can make detectors directly from that. No evidence of supersymmetry so far. We are going to keep exploring in the cross-section parameter space. LHC stops at a certain point. They can't go beyond a certain mass, right? But the direct detection, there's no limit on mass. We are sensitive to both. The worst part would be here, where neither the direct detection nor the LSC can get to. That would be unfortunate, but we, we keep on doing bigger and bigger experiments. Okay, now it seems like, okay, we know what to do. Everything looks fine. We will find dark matter. No, I don't, I can't tell you that, because I don't think anybody can tell you that. We've been working on it for 200 years, and we realize that we have seen a small, we understand a small part of the universe. So it'd be naive for anybody to think that with dark matter is just around the corner. We may never find it. What are you going to do? You make these detectors. You better make detectors that can do a lot of things. And so that's what we have been doing. 
Our biggest advantage has been tight control of the TC. It does a beautiful thing. This is energy resolution plot. It, this is an EV, 10 electron volt, 100 electron volt. As you push on the TC, you lower the TC, the superconducting temperature, you get to better and better resolution. Better resolution means lower threshold, so you can do a lot more things. So what we do is, now that we know how to do this low resolution detector, what can we find to do with it? So it reminds me of the Mission Impossible 2 movie, every search for a hero must begin with something what a hero needs. You need to find applications for your technology. You develop a great technology, but you have to find a use for it. For example, this is a neutrino recoil spectrum. If your threshold is 1 kV, you're not going to see anything. You have to push down your threshold. So, and that's what we've been working on, to push on low threshold. So there's a lot of excitement in low mass WIMPs recently. So we're going to push, we, we, we already know how to get there. Make very low threshold detect, like certainly 100 electron volt, and keep pushing it because it's possible that at the end of the day, you might find, you might have to find dark matter in a completely different manner. Maybe even have to detect single electron hole pair sensitivity so that you can detect light dark matter. I'm not going to go into detail, but once you have this low threshold detector, there are many number of things. And I'm going to spend the next 10 minutes talking about things that we do and will be doing using these fantastic detectors. Solar axions. Dark matter may not be what we think. It may not be weakly interacting massive particles. It may be axions. Axions were invented to solve the strong CP problem. Why does strong interaction not have CP violation? So the idea here is, in the solar core, you have lots of gammas. They will undergo Primakov scattering, and they will convert to axions, possibly, if axions exist. And on the Earth, we do exactly the reverse. Take that axion and convert in electric, you know, a nuclear uh, electric field and convert it back to an axion. The, the amazing thing is, if, you, if your sun, if sun is moving relative to where your detector is, the crystal, because of the Bragg scattering, you'll have a strong dependence on what the rate you're going to see. This was on the APS calendar in 2010. It's a nice plot from our experiment. The energy and the time of the day. This is going to be a very strong dependence on what you're seeing. So in fact, people, uh, we got very competitive results. The best results are from Tokyo uh, Telescope and uh, uh, CAST uh, experiment. What they do is they point at sun, with some sensor technology. In fact, the best result is from CAST at LHC. They use the Large Hadron Collider magnet technology to produce this nice telescope. I mean, is it a telescope? Is it a particle detector? It's both. They look at stars. But as you see, with more detectors, we can cross that in the order of magnitude in sensitivity. We can be the best experiment in the world looking for solar axioms. What else can you do? You saw from Lucas's talk uh, last week that they may be more relativistic uh, species than we think they are. Maybe the number of uh, species is four. How do you look for it? One way to look for that, or the possibility that people think of, is a sterile neutrino. It doesn't interact with standard model interactions, but it can mix. And its mass may be electron volt, one electron volt. How do you detect such a light particle? Does the technology exist? No. Can we make the technology? Yes. How? Because I told you, it's low threshold. The, the pro process we're going to take advantage of is called coherent neutrino scattering, neutral current interaction. And nobody has observed it yet. It certainly exists. It will. It's just the cross-section is lower. Threshold is an issue. But threshold, we know how to beat it. That's what we've been working on for the last three years. Measure the coherent neutrino scattering. Look for non-standard model interactions or mixing that you see. And then you, you'll be able to tell if sterile neutrinos exist or not. The idea is it's a small collaboration, MIT, Stanford, Texas and m This is an MIT reactor. It turns out this monoenergetic neutrino beam, you can only be about 20 meters away from the reactor and then study uh, the neutrino interactions in your detector. So that's very promising. That's what they're going to push on. The key is, again, the low threshold. The detectors will be made at Texas a and What else can you do? This is a result I'm very excited about. We are finishing up uh, uh, this analysis. Lightly ionizing particle. Do you know about fractional charged particle? Yes, quarks. They have fractional charge, two third, one third. But they are, can you find them free? No, they are always bound inside hadrons. But there is nothing in physics that tells you that you can't have free fractionally charged particles. Anything explicitly not forbidden is required. I think it's allowed. My postdoc thinks it's uh, required. But anyway, Gelman said that it's required. 
So they might be lightly ionizing particles. How do you look for them? The problem is F squared. If you take one tenth of uh, fractional charge, your cross section is one hundredth of what you would expect from electromagnetic interaction. But it's a unique opportunity for us. Low threshold, like I've been telling you about, and tracking. There are six detectors in a tower. If a particle goes through, you can tell whether it's lightly ionizing or strongly ionizing. We take advantage of that. I'll skip this energy consistency and then show you this slide again. That's how we reject background. In fact, our analysis, we expect less than 0.05 background events at 90% confidence level using all of our background data set. Okay? So at that point, if you see one event, you have discovered something or you have found systematics. Okay? So we, excuse me, really very little background uh, that, that we expect. The preliminary uh, uh, sensitivity, see, we can go down to 100. We have sensitivity down to 100 of a fractional charge. What is amazing is if it is it, even at one-tenth of a fractional charge, it is almost like neutral. It can be a massive particle, neutral particle. It could be a component of the dark matter. It could be part of the dark matter. Who knows? There's nothing that forbids it. Maybe it will change some galactic dynamics. Uh, we don't know. Maybe it's very low fractional charge. But the key is nobody else can do this because they don't have the low threshold or the tracking like detector. So this result we expect to uh, publish by end of this year. I think in the next uh, couple of months, there's a conference, Particle Physics and Cosmology. That's where Joel Sander will be presenting the result if everything goes well. We're really excited. So in conclusion, I'm almost getting to an end. Current generation technologies, they are doing a great job starting to explore the allowed parameter space. Super CDMS Sudan, Xenon 100, beginning to probe that space. Many promising technologies, but a lot of them are suffer from, suffering from background. If you have background, you're dead. You need to find a way to get down the background. You also need to find cheaper ways to make your detector. Okay, the next generation, this super CDMS, 200 kilograms, xenon one ton, lux, that's going to lead the world over the next couple of years, and other technologies. But not all have the same level of background rejection. Generation three, the prospects in the US are bleak because the US was going to make a deep underground lab, and as I backed out of it, we don't know what's going to happen. We are going to snow lab, there's not enough space for a ton scale. Maybe think outside North America. So it's important to me, my vision is it's important to have detector technology that has multiple particle physics uh, um, uh, possibilities because you never know where the next discovery might come in. And when will we detect dark matter? Time and patience. I can't tell you. The only thing we can do is look for it. And eventually, hopefully, Particle physics astronomers uh, and the collider and particle astrophysics and the astronomers will get enough data to g give us a uh, world view of uh, we can understand what the universe is made of, why we are where we are. Thank you. Right, so what we do is, that's a very good question, because when you have this, let's say, take the same car, let's say um, a, a Toyota Prius, and if it is traveling at 10 miles per hour versus 100 miles per hour, the amount of impact that you're going to get, the recoil is different, right? So all the plots have been to the escape velocity in, in a galaxy. So all the plots made are for the maximum velocity, because we are looking at galactically bound WIMPs, so you take the highest velocity, and that's all these plots are based on that. Everything below that, you can integrate it. Yes. In the beginning, you saw the plot uh, where we took a the bunch of experiments with different deeper So, well, it looks like the, the previous steps were not sufficient for the purpose of those experiments. So, is it a mis expectation, a mis uh, uh, evaluation of the parameters? Right, so basically nobody goes and builds a lab under our lab. It's basically an existing, some lab, maybe it was a mine, mine uh, with active mining or, or no longer mining is being done. So you find space to build your lab. Okay, so none of the labs so far were, or 
almost all of them, were not built for physics or science. They existed and we took advantage of it. Dussel was the only one which was being built for doing underground physics. Now these mines, they existed. I mean, for example, Sudan is an iron mine. So we found it, that's in the US, easily accessible. We went and did it there. But to tell you the truth, uh, none of, these are not deep enough, but we haven't faced the neutron background yet. But we think that with a ton scale, it will be problematic. So if you have option, you want to go to the deepest mine in the world, uh, yeah, that you can get. Yes? Uh, why do we believe it's a green Right. So, so for example, what the first thing that comes to your mind, why not electromagnetic? Right? So it's dark. You see, it doesn't emit light or reflect light. Exactly. It is. So what you start with, is like I said here, the weak interaction is a question mark. Is it weak interaction? It's probably weak interaction, but we don't know. That's what we'll find out as we do the experiment. It's not electromagnetic. We know it's, it has gravity. So the most uh, plausible thing that we can think of is weak interaction because of uh, what we saw, the constraint from astrophysics and uh, standard model physics. So if you look back, if this particle were ever in thermal equilibrium with the early universe, then you come up with a cross-section that's weak cross-section. But this particle may not have weak interaction. We don't know. Until we detect it, we don't know. OK? Yes. So you show some of the, the experiments being done in which they analyze the annual fluctuation. Right. right? Uh, however, if you do see something on CEMS, right. you have an actual signal. Right. You can do the same. You can do the same. You just need more data. Because you're, ma you're basically mapping the, the exactly. whole surrounding spectrum. Exactly. Exactly. And the advantage we will have is, uh, let me get to that annual modulation. For example, the DAMA experiment, which claimed that they have seen uh, annual modulation. OK, so uh, they see annual modulation. But here, remember, they, are not, they don't know each of these points on this curve, whether it's electron recoil, electromagnetic or weak, whereas we will. So not only can we make a modulation, but we also know what goes into that. But it needs a lot of data. So first you have to detect something, then you do. But it is basically, uh, that's a good question, because once you build this large detector, let's say you have discovered waves, then you do astronomy, basically, right, with these detectors. Map out the sky. So this way. One of the questions is, how can, with these uh, various detectors for looking for direct WIMP interactions, right. directional type of... Uh, right. Abilities do, do these hockey pucks have that? Uh, they don't have as of now. We have, the, but that's a direction of R and D. So uh, basically, the question is: if a particle goes in from the top versus the bottom, can we tell? We can't as of now, but it doesn't mean we we couldn't possibly do it because the ionization may have a dependence if you sample it at a very high speed. But there are detector technologies, basically tracking devices, tracking gaseous ionization chambers. If a particle goes from the top or versus the bottom, you would be able to tell. Even with one single interaction, you can tell which direction it was heading towards. So, but th those technologies haven't matured enough uh, to be, uh, you know. So, yeah, but uh, you know, eventually, hopefully, we'll make detectors where you can tell where it came from. Then it would be true astronomy, right? Yes. Is there any lower limit to the cross sections? Uh, you mean expected lower? Right. Yes. So let me just, <laughs> you, 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 that's a scary question, right? So let me just get to the, uh, the landscape plot. OK, so here's the question. Uh, so what you see here are the reaches of different experiments, generation two and generation three. This is what the expected theoretical uh, parameter space is. That's what we expect. But if you look back 10 years ago, this used to be much higher. <laughs> so, you know, theorists will always find a way to uh, change it you know, to match. If we don't see anything, I'm sure 10 years from now, you'll see some parameter space that's here. So when do you stop? I don't know. I mean, you really have to make these detectors. And the way you propose, I, what I think you need to do is not just do one physics. You do multi-physics so that you can convince 
the funding agencies that I'm not just going to look for dark matter which may not be detectable. It may have 10 orders of magnitude uh, lower cross section. But the good thing is if LHC sees something, then we know exactly where to get to. Let's say LHC finds that it's here. Maybe you need a 10 ton experiment. You just go and build a 10 ton. Don't waste money in different technologies and different uh, modes. Is it quickly explain what, how you, what the theoretical limits are, are, what you assume to get those. OK, so that's probably best answered by a theorist. Uh, Vasco, you would like to say what goes into? Yeah, so we just try to explain the dark matter content of these units. Right. And these are some particular volumes of units, and also thermal volumes. Right. If you assume non thermal dark matter in the real energy, there is a way of Minimal supersymmetric model. Right. So honestly, there's, you know, at some point you just have to, uh, you know, say that it's, you have looked enough. So what we are hoping is LHC would tell us where it is, where is the ballpark. But for the axion search, there is a lower limit. They, for the axion search, yes, experts. yeah. So. And we can actually, with, uh, as you saw, we can go beyond the horizontal branch stars with the, with the technology we have. In a, in a couple of years. Yes? Is Watts Carrera involved with the uh, fractional charge? No, no. That's actually entirely. Uh, Joel Sander was my postdoc, and uh, when I was a postdoc in Santa Barbara, he was a graduate student. We started this idea six years ago, and we were analyzing, and it turns out we got to a point where our knowledge was limited. We couldn't calculate the cross sections. So it took a long time, but my graduate student, Kunj Prasad, he managed to do it. So that's why we restarted the analysis, knowing what to expect. Because for those low fractional charges, the problem is how do you count uh, what, how many, you know, in the Poisson statistics, how do you know exactly what energy deposition you're going to get? It's really not just multiply by a certain factor. It's much more involved to calculate that cross-section or the expected. No, Blas Cabrera is not involved. He was involved in monopole searches, but Martin Pearl, at Slack, who, uh, who discovered, got the Nobel Prize for tau lepton, he is involved, not in this experiment, but his own version. But I think there's no one else who has our sensitivity. One last question, anyone? Let's thank uh, Rupak for Thank you.